1 Thessalonians chapter 5 says, in everything, give thanks. Verse doesn't say to give thanks for everything. It says to give thanks in everything. It's a huge difference. For example, I'm not thankful for the coronavirus, but in our present situation, there are things to be thankful for. For example, in our present situation, we have opportunities to share the good news of Christ with people who are searching for answers. In our present situation, we have opportunities to grow in our relationship with the Lord, that, that we might become more loving, more kind, more joyous, more, more patient. In our present situation, we have opportunities to show love to others who are in need. One thing I'm personally thankful for is all the family time my family and I have been able to uh, spend together. My, my family is very competitive. I have no idea where they get that from. But they're very competitive, and we enjoy doing family game nights. And with a competitive family, family game nights are a lot of fun. Uh, one of the games that we play sometimes is called Would You Rather. And, and Would You Rather you're given a couple of options, and then you have to choose between two options. Uh, sometimes they're good choices. Uh, would you rather have all traffic lights you approach be green or never have to stand in line again? Those both sound good. You, you can't go wrong with a choice like that. Would you rather be able to fly or to turn invisible? Hey, th those both sound great to me. Would you rather meet your favorite fictional character or your favorite musician? Hey, just pick one. You can't lose with choices like that. Some choices, though, aren't so good. Would you rather always have a song stuck in your head or an itch that you can't reach? Would you rather have all dogs try to attack you when they see you or all birds try to attack you when they see you? Would you rather be stranded in the desert or the jungle? Would you rather have the police hunting you for a murder you didn't commit or a psychopathic clown hunting you? I don't want dogs or birds trying to attack me. I don't want to be stranded in the, in the desert or the jungle. I don't want to have the police or a psychopathic clown trying to hunt me down. There are no good answers to those questions. Whatever you choose is bad. In Matthew chapter 22, Jesus is faced with a question that seems to have no good answer. Jesus, though, takes this question and he uses it as an opportunity to teach a life-changing truth. If you have your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 22. And I say if you have your Bibles, and I know that you're watching this from home because there's no one here in the sanctuary right now. It's really an odd feeling uh, speaking in the sanctuary to an empty sanctuary, somebody that viewed it last week, they said, well, why, why are you looking around w when you're preaching? Honestly, I'm trying to envision our whole church family here. And, and by the way, I know where everybody sits. We all have assigned seats, right? Uh, but, but as I share God's word with you this morning, I want to share it from my heart. And, and I want to just imagine you sitting here, although I know most of you that are viewing this are are sitting at home. But let's have a word of prayer right now. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you, Lord, for an opportunity to look into your word. I pray, Lord, that you would be honored, that you would be pleased, that you would be glorified. And I pray, Lord, that you would change our hearts and our minds and our lives and make us more like you. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, again, we're in Matthew chapter 22 uh, today. The first thing we want to look at this morning is the motive for the question that they're about to ask. Verse 15 says, Then the Pharisees went and plotted how they might entangle him in his talk. You see, the Pharisees didn't care what answer Jesus gave. This wasn't really a sincere question. It was a question that was just intended to, to trip him up, that no matter what he answered, it, it would be a bad answer. It's what we call a loaded question, the, the classic loaded question that most people are familiar with is someone asked a, ask a man, have you stopped beating your wife? 
See, that's a loaded question. There is no good answer. Every answer to that question is terrible. If the man says yes, well, then it sounds like he, he had been beating his wife. If the man says no, well, then it sounds like he, he's continuing to do so. It's a loaded question. There are no good answers. Now let's look at the messengers who brought the question. Verse 16 says, The Pharisees sent, him to, to, uh, sent to him their disciples with the Herodians. You couldn't find two groups more opposite than the Pharisees and the Herodians. The Pharisees were the religious leaders. And they believed that the answer to, to all the problems in society were to, to keep their religious rules. If everybody just followed their lead, if everybody followed their religious rules, everything would be fine. The Herodians weren't religious. The Herodians were political. They believed that the answer to, to all that ailed the world was government. The, uh, the Pharisees hated the Roman government. The Roman government got in the way of the things that they wanted to do. The Roman government, they even believed that their Caesar was a god, and so the, so the Pharisees hated the Roman government. The, the Herodians, on the other hand, they loved the Roman government. The Roman government needed people to come in and to govern different regions, and they put the, the Herods in, in charge of the different reasons, regions. And for that reason, reason the Herodians, they, they loved the government. The Pharisees were conservative, the Herodians were liberal. The Pharisees were right-wing hardliners, the Herodians were left-wing extremists. You couldn't find two more opposite groups than the Pharisees and the Herodians. The only thing that brought those two groups together was hate, hatred for Jesus. Jesus said in John chapter 15, if the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. Why would anyone hate Jesus? You know, you talk to most people today and, and, and they're, they're shocked that anyone hated Jesus. But you know what? People hated Jesus back then, and there are people that, that hate Jesus today. Why would anyone hate Jesus? One reason is this. Jesus claimed to be the only way to God. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. People don't like that. People want to choose their own way to come to God. Some people think Christianity is too narrow, and in a sense, they're right. But if you think about it, the right answer is usually narrow. If I ask you what's 12 times 5, there's only one right answer. The right answer is 60. You may be able to express it a few different ways, but there's only one right answer. There's an infinite number of wrong answers. 61's the wrong answer. 59's the wrong answer. A million and two is the wrong answer. You know, and it's the same way with this. Jesus says there's only one answer to the question of how to get to God, and it's through him. There's no other way to God. Romans chapter 10 says, I testify about them that they're zealous for God, but their zeal isn't based on knowledge. They ignore the righteousness that comes from God and seek instead to establish their own righteousness. You see, most people ignore the righteousness that comes from God, and they try to come to God their own way, by their own system, by their own religion, by their own good works. But Jesus says there's only one way to God, and it's through faith in him. We're all familiar with John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Just three verses later, Jesus said, John 3, 19, this is the verdict. The light has come into the world, that's Jesus. The light has come into the world, but men love the darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light, hates Jesus, and doesn't come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. 
Some people hate Jesus because their deeds are evil. But I believe the main reason that the Pharisees and the Herodians hated Jesus is they saw him as being a threat to their power. Just a few days before this, Jesus rode into Jerusalem as it was prophesied that one day the Messiah would do. The prophet Zechariah said that, Behold, your king is coming to you. The promised king, the Messiah, would come to Jerusalem and he would ride on a donkey on the, on the, foal, uh, on the colt, uh, a foal of the donkey. And when he arrived in Jerusalem, some people saw him for who he was. They saw him as being the Messiah. They said, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna to the son of David. That's what the Messiah was called, the son of David. Now, if Jesus was a Messiah... It would mean an end to the Pharisees and the Herodians' power. The Pharisees, they were the political, the the Pharisees were the religious rulers. Everybody followed him. But if Jesus was the Messiah, they'd stop following the Pharisees and they'd start following Jesus. The Herodians, they were the political rulers. But if Jesus was the Messiah, he would be the one who would rule and reign over all the earth. That's why they hated Jesus. Jesus was a threat to their power. Jesus' answer to their question would address that very issue. Verse 16, they sent to him their disciples with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you're true and teach the way of God in truth, nor do you care about anyone, for you don't regard the person of men. In other words, you don't show favoritism. Boy, they're really laying it on thick here for Jesus. Interestingly enough, everything they say is true. Jesus is true. He does teach the way of God in truth, and he doesn't show favoritism. They try to butter him up, and then they spring the trap. Tell us, therefore, what do you think? Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Now, here's the trap. Regardless of what he answers to this question, it's going to get him in trouble. If Jesus says, don't pay your taxes, the Roman government will have him executed. See, you and I, we can complain about our taxes, but we still have to pay them. See, back then, you couldn't complain about your taxes to the Roman government. Stuff like that, if it got around, it would, there'd be a groundswell movement. There'd be a revolt against the government. They weren't going to put up with that. Somebody tells the people to stop paying their taxes, that person would be executed. What if Jesus said to pay your taxes? Well, then he'd be viewed by the Jewish people as a traitor, as someone who was supporting the, the Romans and, and their system. Here's why. There were three main taxes that Jews had to pay to the Roman government every year. Now, there were additional taxes. If they had building projects, they would tax the people. If they needed to build more, more, more buildings, they needed some other project completed, they would, they would tax the people. But there were three main taxes that the Jewish people had to pay to the Romans every year. First of all, there was a land tax. Whatever your land produced, you had to give 10% of that to the Roman government. So that was the first tax, the land tax. There was also a sales tax, or they called it a custom tax. It was a tax of 2 to 5% on all goods and merchandise. It's better than our sales tax in New Jersey. But the tax that everyone hated to pay above all the other taxes is the tax that we find here. It was the, the person tax. This tax... The tax referred to here isn't a tax on goods or merchandise. It's a tax on a person. The tax originated with Herod Archelaus in 6 AD. It was a reminder to every Jew he was a slave of Rome and subservient to Rome. The Romans invented this tax to put people in in their place. In the King James Version, it's called the the tribute. It was a tax that you would have to give to say, I don't belong to myself, I belong to Rome. Rome owns me, 
I, I don't own myself. I'm, I'm a slave to Rome. And that's why the Jewish people hated it so much. By the way, the tax itself wasn't a lot of money. It was just one single denarius, which was a day's wage. But it's what the tax represented that, that, that the people resented and hated. As a matter of fact, in Acts chapter 5, uh, the story, uh, Gamaliel is speaking and he says this, Judas the Galilean appeared in the days of the census and led a band of people in revolt. According to the history books, according to Josephus, the revolt was against this tax. It was against this person tax that he led the revolt. What happened to him? He was killed and all his followers were scattered. That's how much the Jewish people hated this tax. That, that they tried to, to lead a revolt against the Roman government, against the Roman military machine, and, and then it was crushed. And that's how serious the Roman government took compliance to this tax. Whatever Jesus answered, his enemies thought they had him. If Jesus said, you know, don't pay the tax, the Romans would have him executed. If Jesus said, pay the tax the people would hate him. So now let's look at the master's reply to the question. Verse 18, But Jesus perceived their wickedness and said, Why do you test me, you hypocrites? Show me the tax money. So they brought him a denarius. No, denarius was just simply a coin. It was about the size of a dime. A little like the coins that we would have. It would have a, a picture on the front, and the picture would be of a Caesar. And then it would also have an inscription. And on the front of a denarius, it would say, Caesar Augustus Tiberius, son of the divine Augustus. You, you remember, that really irked the Jewish people because the, the Romans, the, the money that they had to use to pay the tax, had a picture of Caesar on the front and called him divine, called him God. And, and then on the back of the coin, there would be another picture and there would be an inscription. And the inscription said, Maxim Pontiff, which means the high priest. He said to them, whose image and inscription is this? They said, Caesar's. Jesus said to them, give, this, th give to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and give to God the things that are God's. What's it mean, give to Caesar the things that are Caesar's? It means pay the tax. It means pay the tax. The money, the money that you use belongs to Caesar. It has his image on it. The roads that you use belong to Caesar. Pay the tax. Jesus said the coin belonged to Caesar because it had Caesar's image and inscription on it. Think about it this way. If you and I are walking down the road, keeping about six feet distance now in our social distancing era, if you and I are walking down the road and we see something laying on the ground and, and, and we see, oh, it's a driver's license and a credit card. You reach down, you pick it up, you, you look at the credit card and you say, oh, it says Harry Barry. And I say, oh yeah, that's my credit card. I say, your name's not Harry Barry. I say, yeah, I know, that's not my name, but that's my credit card. Would you believe me? No, the inscription says it belongs to someone else. You pick up the driver's license, you look at the picture, you look at me, and you say, yeah, that's not your picture. I say, yeah, I know it's not my picture, but it is my driver's license. Do you believe me? No, because that's not my inscription. It's not my image. So it doesn't belong to me. It belongs to whoever's image and inscription is on it. If it has Caesar's image on it, if it has Caesar's inscription on it, it belongs to Caesar. Give to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, but give to God the things that are God's. So what belongs to God? Anything that has his image stamped on it. What has God's image stamped on it? Genesis chapter 1 says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. What's it mean 
to be created in the image of God. Well, it really means several things. For, for one thing, God is a trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. God has created you in, in a unique way that, that, in a sense, you're a trinity also, body, soul, and spirit. Uh, but it goes deeper than that. It's just one of the ways that God has stamped his image on you. God has also stamped his image on you by giving you certain attributes, certain characteristics that God also has. Uh, let me give you an example, Ephesians chapter 5. Imitate God in everything you do. You can imitate God because God has created you in his image. Imitate God in everything you do because you're his dear children. Walk in the way of love just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. It's just one of the attributes that you share with God, the ability to love. God has made you in his image. God loves, and so then you have the ability to, to love. We, we share certain characteristics with God. Obviously, God is perfect in everything that he does and in everything that he is, and we're not perfect, but we can have those same characteristics, and we can become more like Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 says we're being transformed into his likeness with ever-increasing glory. In other words, God's desire for you is that every day you become more like him, more like him in his character, in love, in joy, in patience. God has already arrived in all of those areas. He's perfect, but you and I, we can increase in all of those areas. And become more like Christ. Romans chapter 8 verse 29 says, Those he foreknew, he also predestined. God chose the destination that he wants you and I to arrive at. He also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. God's ultimate destination for you is the image of his son. That you be like Jesus Christ. That's the direction that, that you and I should be headed in. The problem with life is most people are headed in the wrong direction. Most people are, are chasing the wrong thing. Ralph Barton was one of the world's great cartoonists. He wrote in his suicide note, I've had few difficulties, many friends, and great successes. I've gone from wife to wife and from house to house, visited great countries of the world, but I'm fed up with inventing devices to fill up 24 hours of the day. He had what most people want. The problem was he was chasing the wrong thing and it left him disillusioned and dissatisfied. What happens when you start pursuing Christ? and Christ-likeness? What happens when you allow God to live his life in you and through you and change you and, and, and make you more like him? Martin Seligman is a professor at the University of Pennsylvania. One day he gave his class an assignment. They came in and they had a little discussion and, and he asked them where happiness came from. The class discussed it, and they came up with the general consensus that, that happiness came from doing fun things, from doing pleasurable things, things that we want. Seligman said, well, I want to give you an assignment then. I want you to, you to choose one fun thing or one pleasurable thing that you want to do. Do it and then write about it. He said, but in addition to that, I, I want you to do one selfless act for someone else. Afterwards, he wrote, the results were life-changing. The afterglow of a pleasurable activity, hanging out with friends, watching a movie, or eating a hot fudge sundae, paled with the effects of the kind action. Why did they find a greater joy in serving others? That's the image of God. The Son of Man didn't come to be served, but to serve. See, they found joy because they were being like Christ. That was the, the image of God. 
A freshman at the University of Virginia wrote about something that happened to her in high school. She wrote, she wrote, we were riding the bus home on a snowy night. We passed an old woman shoveling her driveway. One of the guys asked the bus driver to let him out. I thought he was just going to take a shortcut home. But then I saw him take the shovel and begin to shovel the old woman's driveway. I felt a lump in my throat, and I started to cry. I'd never noticed him before, but now I felt like I might love him. What did she see in this other person? Christ-likeness, love, kindness, compassion. And it drew her to him. He said to them, Give to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and give to God the things that are God. When they heard these words, they marveled and left him and went their way. It's kind of sad, isn't it? They should have fallen on their knees. They should have worshipped him. They should have recognized him for, for who he was. But they so wanted to maintain power in their lives and over everyone else that they just left him and went their way unchanged. Give to God what belongs to God. How can you give yourself to God? Romans 6.13 says, don't offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. Give every part of yourself to God. First of all, give your mind to God. Fill your mind with the word of God. George Fuchel was an early IBM programmer, and he coined the term garbage in, garbage out. The idea was when they were programming, if they programmed the wrong stuff into the computer, they would get the wrong results out. Same thing's true with our mind. You program the wrong thing in. You feed your mind with the wrong thing. You feed your mind with, with, with flawed thinking. You feed your mind with worldly philosophy. You'll get the wrong product out. We need to, to feed our mind with the word of God. We need to give our minds to God. Philippians 4 says, fix your thoughts on what's true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Second thing I would say is give your tongue to God. Proverbs 18 verse 21 says, life and death are in the power of the tongue. If it wasn't in God's word, I would think that's an overstatement. But God says, life and death are in the power of the tongue. The things you say to other people have the ability to, to change the course of their life, for good or for bad. Your words are more powerful than you think. Someone wrote, a careless word may kindle strife. A cruel word may wreck a life. A bitter word may hate and still. A brutal word may smite and kill. A gracious word may smooth the way. A joyous word may light the day. A timely word may lessen stress. A loving word may heal and bless. Ephesians chapter 4 says, Don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only, only what's helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Say things that are helpful. Say things that build others up. Say things that meet needs. And say things that benefit everyone who hears. Finally, number three, give your hands and your feet to God. Go where God wants you to go and do what God wants you to do.